Hey, everybody. Welcome to The Hard Sell with me, your host, Joel Stevenson. Uh, if, you, if you're new to The Hard Sell, uh, the goal here is, or the idea is that selling is hard. Um, and we're trying to make selling easier by bringing experts in the field um, here to answer your questions and to talk about their experiences to, to make selling a little bit easier and more successful for everybody. And uh, today we've got a, a great guest. Um, Matthew Bellows was uh, the, fa- the co-founder um, and CEO of Yesware, uh, where I am currently the CEO in full disclosure, um, and is, is also co-founder and a CEO of his newest company, Bodeswell, which I'll have him describe in a minute. And so I think, you know, in addition to other companies before that, so I think now uh, Matthew is officially a serial entrepreneur. And so Matthew, welcome to the show. Thanks, Joel. Great to be here. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, great to have you. Um, yeah, I think we, we, we worked out all the sound issues now. We are we are ready to go. <laughs> um, so, Matthew, maybe just uh, start off by, uh, I think the, at this point, a lot of people are, are going to be familiar with YesWare, but maybe tell us a little bit more about your new venture uh, and uh, and what that's all about. And then I, I, we'll get right into, into some interesting questions on the sales side. Sure. So I'm about two and a half, almost three years ago now, I started a company called Bodeswell, which is at bodeswell.io. And it's basically financial planning for the rest of us, financial planning for people who don't have a financial planner and want to make their own plan and own their own plan and update it. And when you wake up at two in the morning and you think to yourself, how's this all going to work out? Am I, am I going to be able to help my kids with college? Am I going to be able, able to retire at you know, 60, not 80? Uh, you can go to your bodes well plan and it will tell you how you're doing and also how to improve your, how to improve your plan. So you have a better chance of reaching those goals. Right. Certainly something. And I think, you know, it, you had described it to me at one point of like sort of democratizing access to the type of information that's maybe traditionally only been available to higher net worth individuals. Is that fair? Yep, exactly right. Exactly right. There's 85 million U.S. households who don't have access to a financial planner. And so by putting all this knowledge and expertise into software and making it really easy to use, um, we hope to be able to provide the benefits of planning to many, many, many more people. Right. Well, certainly, certainly a lofty goal. And, uh, and you know, from what I can tell, you've made a lot of progress in a short amount of time. And but we're, maybe what we'll, we'll focus on here today is so this you've done multiple companies, and for a lot of companies, you know, unless you're maybe strictly selling to consumers and you don't have any sort of a B two B motion um, inside of your company, at some point you've got to go get the first customer. And we had um, uh, Matt Bloomberg, who I think you know uh, yeah. on the show a, a few episodes ago, and he was sort of talking about this idea of, you know, you start with whiteboard selling before you can advance to PowerPoint selling before you can advance to sort of uh, PDF right. selling. And m- maybe just talk about that first stage of like landing your first big customer, the first real customer. I think you've, you've been pretty successful at this over time and have some ideas. Maybe just talk about that a little bit more. Yeah, well, I mean, one of the things that differentiates bodes well from what we're doing from a lot of other sort of financial planning software is that we are a B2B company. So we're not trying to get individual end users to come to our website and create their plan. Instead, we're going out to the largest financial institutions in the country and partnering with them to co-develop digital financial planning applications for their customers and their use cases and their products and their customers' needs. So, yeah, so I I, I know (laughs) I've been down this road a couple times now of trying to sell, uh, you know, some startup product to a big, huge, uh, publicly traded multinational corporation. Um, So, yeah, I've had the opportunity to think about this quite a bit and and make a whole bunch of mistakes. Um, So where do you want to begin? I mean, there's a lot to say. Well, why don't we start with maybe trying to figure out who you should even approach? Um, right. for, you know, so you've, you know, you've, you're, you're the world is your oyster in some ways as, as you're a startup and which is sort of a blessing and a curse. So like, how do you, how do you try to, you can't go after everybody. How do you try to narrow down the list to figure 
out a set of people that, you know, if you sold them would change the business, but also that you have, you know, some, you know, snowballs chance in hell of actually getting, you know, a deal across the finish line. Right. Right. <laughs> exactly. I mean, there, there's a lot of considerations that go into that. Um, but and much of it is driven by your sort of product. Um, like, is your product meant to help a small company, a medium sized company or a large company? And is your product meant to help a certain industry or go horizontal across industries? Um, but, but generally speaking, like, I think the way that most startups get off the ground is by doing a couple things. One is they start writing about what they're doing. They write about it on LinkedIn. They write about it on their blog. And they start just with very cheap um, but compelling content that tells people, hey, I'm doing something interesting here. I'm innovating in my space. Here's what I think about the current situation. Here's how I think it could be different and better. And here's how we can help. And then the second thing, at least that's really the only way that's worked for me, is to go to conferences and trade shows and just walk up to booths and start talking to people and start telling them what you're doing and asking them questions. And um, I mean, I'll never forget the first company I had was a media company. And it was, it was the idea that pe- it was sort of a bet that people would play video games on their cell phones. And at Consumer Electronics Show 2000, which, you know, is a sense of how old I am, uh, I walked up to the Sprint booth and I started talking to this guy, Chip Novak, who was the head of data programs for Sprint. And I said, could I interview you for my blog? And he was like, yeah, why not? So we did this interview, posted the interview that night. The next morning, I get a phone call, and the guy's, I said, hello, it's Matthew Bellows. And he said, hey, this is Paul Palmieri. I run data for Verizon. Why don't you interview me? And so, you know, it just sort of snowballed from there, where basically all these people started getting interested in this little, tiny, little niche blog because we were looking at the industry in a different and compelling way to them. Yeah, that so, that's interesting. I mean, it, it sort of reminds me a little bit, actually, this is a uh, maybe as non-intuitive um, when I first say it, but a lot of the way we built Wayfair, so when we were first trying to get a lot of suppliers on a Wayfair, we were really selling them because we were CSN stores yeah. and no one had ever heard of us. And we went to trade shows too, and we, we just went from booth to booth to booth and tried to tell our story and convince people. And that, w- that was extremely effective. I, I think the trade show thing is underappreciated because when you think of trade shows you think of like buying the booths and setting up the booths and sitting in the booths and waiting for people to come by but instead if you go and you walk the floor talk to all the companies the people sitting at the booths just want to talk to people and then afterwards you post up at the bar and buy rounds of drinks and hang around like it can be a very effective way to spend your marketing dollar Right. Yeah. Because you're just sort of, you're paying the cost of an attendee versus, uh, you know, having to do, you know, pay the, the union rate for electricians and all that stuff to put the thing up. That was a very different uh, proposition. What, you know, it's sort of a non sequitur, but like, do you think that's going to be possible with COVID? Like, like if, if I'm somebody that's trying to get traction right now and there maybe aren't any, in-person trade shows scheduled for a period of time like what what do you what do you think the next best thing to do would be so so i've been really impressed actually with the matchmaking software that a lot of these conference organizers are rolling out where before the show starts you say here's what i'm interested in and then they do like a double opt-in match with the companies that are attending and and then they book 15 minute slots for you and I, I've had a lot of success in just connecting with people for short periods of time, giving them the quick pitch, answering their questions, and then you know building a relationship from there. In some ways, it's more efficient because you don't have to travel to the spot. Right, right, right. Yeah, that I mean, especially from a time perspective, um, you know, uh, you know, not only the the time that you spend in a trade show, walking from place to place, but just simply getting to the trade show. 
um, th there's definitely a lot of uh, definitely a lot of benefits there. So let's say so so maybe then then let's move to the next step in the process. So let's say you've you've now had some initial conversation with a company that's a lot bigger than you. Yeah. Um, now what? Yes. <laughs> well, the first thing to say is if they're at all interested, they're going to start doing their research. Like that that person on the other side, the person who could be your entree into the org is going to do their research. So they're going to look at your LinkedIn page. They're going to read your Twitter feed. They're going to um, look at your blog or your company website and try to figure out, is it worth me risking my career or my next promotion introducing this person into the company? And um, the way you communicate that it is, is by having, um, you know, at least good content, at least thoughtful takes, at least some professional credibility. Um, and assuming that you have that, you get past that first threshold, then there's going to be a series of one-on-one -on -one meetings with this person that either may be your champion or may be introducing you to your champion. And by, by champion here, I mean like the, the person who's going to be the, the buyer, the main buyer of your product. Um, and so, so assuming that you can get that introduction, then I think we can talk about next steps. But the very first step is to, see, to try to figure out, is the person I'm talking to who I met at the trade show the champion, like the buyer? Or are they not empowered to make, you know, a sort of take me to the next level decision? And instead, do they need to introduce me to somebody in the company? Right. And... And is that the sort of thing that you could normally assess during the conversation with the person at the trade show? Or is that something where after you have the conversation, you then you got to go back and do some research, have some conversations, do some triangulation, and then formulate your plan? Um, I mean, if it happens at the trade show, I mean, as soon as this happens that you see this person could be a big deal, then the better, obviously, but usually not. <laughs> usually, usually you sort of have to build some trust and build some rapport um, with this person before you can even ask the question. So, what you know, what are the next steps here? Like, you, you want to show them that this is viable, helpful, interesting, potentially game changing for them and therefore their boss or their boss's boss. And then, you know, once they're sort of really interested, then you could ask, like, what's the next step here? Like, in each each of these points where you're selling, you're also qualifying, right? Because there are people out there, surprisingly, who will lead a startup on for weeks or months for no particular reason. <laughs> and you don't want to get stuck in those relationships where people just sort of string you along and can't actually make a difference in your life. And so while you're selling them on how great your solution is, you're also qualifying them to see if this is for real or not. Right. And like, are, are there, are there tips or signs that you've identified over time that, that help you determine whether someone's going to be sort of the, the helper or the, the time waster? Um, I, I, I'm afraid that it's very hard to know that out of the gate. Because most of the people are, if they're not going to be the helpful, we'll just, we'll just say no. And that's great. That's helpful. They're just qualifying themselves out. The people who are going to be the time wasters are not going to say that. They're going to string you along. And so it's really after like the second or third call, i.e. the, you know, you're coming into the second or third hour of your relationship where you can really start to say, are you serious about this? Is this really helpful? Is this really interesting? Is this going somewhere or not? Um, I also, it, it gets to the whole like following up and email etiquette and sort of part of the sales process too, because I think that in some ways we, we send too many emails, we follow up too much um, because that too much follow up makes, makes it feel like I'm trying to, I'm trying to sell you something and I'm not busy selling anybody else anything. So it's, I'd like to think of it like a date, you know, you, you don't, you want to follow up and express your interest, but you don't want to seem too, too eager to have the next date. 
Right. It, and sometimes people talk about this, this idea of like the, the just following up email as being not a great email in a lot of cases. Sure. Um, and it, instead, you know, if you are going to follow up, at least having be able to deliver some sort of value in the subsequent exchanges. Um, Every single time. I would yeah. never send an email without giving some piece of information, some insights, some congratulations, some questions, some personal thing. Right. And, and let's say you're, you, let's say you're, you're able to do that successfully. Um, if you're doing this for the first time, like, do, do you have a, a point of view about how long you think it should take to get to that sort of second or third hour of your relationship where you're, you're figuring out if, if this is going somewhere or, or, or you got to go, you got to go either find another contact at the same company or go find a new company? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, so at the, at the conference online or in person, um, you, you know, you, you want to leave that conference with 10 or you want to go to the conference with five meetings at least, and you want to leave with 10 or 15 contacts at least. So you should be working all those contacts simultaneously and they're filtering themselves out. Um, and, and it should take no more than I think a month to figure out if there's something happening here at this company, at least that it's on the front burner. Now, I think all of us have had the chance where, where they, we start a relationship with a company, it goes quiet for six months. We never hear from them. And then something comes up and they reach out and they say, Hey, you know, time is right now. So you don't want to burn those bridges, but at the same time, you definitely don't want to spend time endlessly following up because you're just going to annoy people. Right. Right. So let, let's say you, let's say you make it past those initial stages. Now you're talking to the right person and there are meaningful business discussions being had. How do you, how do you sort of present your company and your idea that, you know, has no revenue, perhaps has, you know, yeah. little track record, maybe has not much more than sort of a proof of concept um, to a, an established company that's got a bunch of different ways that they could go spend their time and resources. How do you convince somebody that the, uh, the right way for them to, to spend some of their time and resources is partnering with this sort of new entity that, that's, that doesn't have a track record? Right. <laughs> it, it seems unlikely, but it is, actually is possible to do. And, and I think the reason why it's possible in general is because every additional phone call or meeting that you're on with a representative from that company is an indication of interest because they, they could be spending their time on more profitable things. And so as long as you're qualifying out the, the 10% of people that are sort of glad handers, th there is some value that they're seeing by continuing to engage. And so the question really is, what is the value that they're seeing? So I, I love starting calls with new representatives from the sort of prospect company by just asking them that. Like, wh why did you take this call today? W what is it about what, I, what you've heard about me or my company that made you want to take this call. And, and you're be amazed at how open people are about the thing that got them interested. And then you could sort of say, well, let me put my demo or my explanation in that context so that, you know, it's relevant to you. Yeah. Right. I mean, you know, sort of back to some of the core, uh, selling, you know, tenants of, you know, asking good questions and really understanding your customer is, is key to, to any sort of a, a business deal. It sounds like it's no, no different in this case than it is when you, you've got a more established uh, selling process. Yeah. It's, it, 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 I hate this. I hate the sales methodologies that are like, here are the 10 questions you have to ask. And as on the receiving side, you, you know, you feel like you're being grilled by the sales yeah. guy who's taking up more and more of your time. It's got to fill out this, this, the, 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 the template. <laughs> yeah, exactly. My boss told me you have to answer these 10 questions before I'll tell you the price or whatever, but it does need to feel like a back and forth, you know, and, and I do need to know, like if I'm selling you, I do need to know why you bothered to take the time at all. Um, and if I can, if you can share that with me, then I can, 
I can help explain either why my solution fits or, or why it doesn't, you know, frankly, because we shouldn't be wasting anybody's time if, if what you're looking for is not what we're offering. Yeah, here, 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 here to to no time wasting. Um, this is somebody that that's sort of on on both ends of those conversations from time right. to time. <laughs> exactly. This is the wonderful thing about um, the first five deals of your startup, um, because you know once you're going, once you're if you're a salesperson out there trying to close deals and hit your quota, then you sort of can't really waste a single lead, um, but as a startup person just getting going, like you're searching for the right fit. You're, you're, you're both trying to sell something to get uh, revenue, but you're also trying to figure out who is my target customer? What kind of company do I serve in general? And so you're catching that very wide and qualifying, 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 looking for signal and all this noise. So it's much more important actually for your first five deals to um, to ask the harder questions and try to figure out how real this is. And so, and so let, let's assume that you, you now have a real deal. There's, there's sort of, there's, you know, good fit and all parties have kind of agreed to work together. Well, well actually, now, wait, wait, wait. Yeah. you just skipped like 10 steps, <laughs> right? Because, because like now let's say I've got my champion. <laughs> he, 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 he or she wants the product. This is something that she has identified as uh, like a real thing that could move the needle. She's going to make her bonus if this thing gets rolled out in a year kind of thing. But then she has to go into her organization. So then you got to talk about budget. Then you got to talk about integration. Then you got to talk about security. You got to answer the high level questions and give her the material and insight and ammunition that she needs to go into her organization and sell this thing. Because as you, as you know, there's no enterprise deal done for more than $25,000 a year that could be signed off by one person, right? And there's a committee of people that have to review absolutely everything. So then I think the next step is really about demoing again and again to all these experts, expert in security, expert in privacy, expert in integration, expert in APIs, et cetera, and showing your thing again and again and again and convincing them all, or at least explaining to them all the benefits that, uh, that your champion sees. And then eventually <laughs> after all of that work, <laughs> You, you get to the question I was going to ask, which is yeah. then you got to figure out how to price something that's never been priced before. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So, the, so then what do you do? Yeah. So, so, so pricing is really one of the most exciting things in the entire process because, um, you know, like let's say, well, I'll just tell you about Bodeswell, right? So we started this thing with a, with a consumer, end consumer emotional need in mind. Um, benefit society and help people sleep at night. Um, we chose to go B two B. We found a connection at American Express, who introduced us to someone in another division, who was not the the champion, but was very influential with the champion. She then introduced us to the champion. The champion sees the benefit of it, and then we have to do pricing. And so there's a thousand different ways to come to pricing, but um, the way the way I did it for American Express was I said, um, "What is the value of of each card member to the organization?" And you can just you just you know take the number of card members and divide by the market cap, or sorry, divide the market cap by the number of card members, and you get a number, and then you say what's the retention value of that card member, i.e. How, how valuable is it to have them stick around for another year? And then we think this product bodes well, will help you retain 10% more customers. And frankly, if it doesn't, it, we're wasting our time here. So you're sort of implicitly saying it does. And therefore the, the, the value of bodes well to American Express is X. But I'm not saying that you, we need to get paid X. We should really get paid 
10% of X. So our price for next year is going to be, you know, Y dollars per year per customer. There, there's lots of different ways of doing that. But I, I guess my point is that like from the outside, not knowing their strategy, not knowing their pricing policies, not knowing his budget, not knowing any of that stuff, you can come up with a top down number that's like reasonably thoughtful. And then you present it to him. Now I presented it to, to this guy, Phil, and he, he just like, he laughed. He was like, that's ridiculous. That's way too high. Like we're never going to pay that. <laughs> <laughs> but he appreciated the thoughtfulness that went into it. And then he said, but here's what I can do. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I think that's how you start a pricing conversation. That should really, that will take, you know, uh, months or maybe years to, to really figure out. Right. Yeah. Pricing is certainly, uh, um, it's a complicated world, but as you say, it's pretty exciting because, you know, that's sort of where, you know, ideally you're mapping what your company does to the value it's delivering. And if you can yes. get those things lined up well, um, then, you know, uh, then it becomes more explicit what the real contract is, you know, beyond sort of the, the paper um, in terms of value exchanged. Um, all it, right. So, it, so sorry, can yeah, I say what yeah. about that also? Because yeah. it, it, it's also exciting because as a startup person, you're kind of on a search for truth. Like you're trying to figure out, is this idea actually going to work? And Pricing is kind of where the rubber meets the road with regard to that. Because if someone wants to pay you a dollar and you need a hundred thousand dollars, then it's not working. And either you've got to find someone else or you've got to think of a new thing to sell. And, and, and so I don't think enough, um, enough conversation in the startup world gets spent on pricing actually. Um, but to me, it's the best indication. I think as you're saying, that you're either onto something or you're not. Yeah, so I should start calling you the seeker, maybe. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> That's it. It's an interesting. It's an interesting way to. Um, it's an interesting way to, to think about it. Um, yeah, I, I hadn't thought about it that way before. I, I like that. Um, all right. Well, let, let's say that you you actually you you then. You know, we're sort of winding, getting down to the end here. But you know, you you've now got a deal done. Um, it it potentially provides a template for another deal. Maybe do you know yeah. two or three more. Now you like you finally got enough conviction and traction. Maybe you've got further investment at this point. Now additional salespeople are going to start showing up, and you're not going to be doing all the deals. You're going to get somebody else to do the deals. So you start talk about like how do you get the first or the first handful of salespeople into your new venture and successful and, and able to, to sell the product. Right. I think it, it's a common um, mistake for founders, especially uh, technical founders to hire the first salesperson too early. I think it's unavoidable that the CEO um, has to sell the first call it five deals herself or himself. And then having done that, they sort of earn the right to bring in their first salesperson. And the first salesperson, the way I think about the first salesperson is not that they are going to be the VP that scales the thing up. It's really just they're going to be another salesperson alongside you, the CEO, you know, running a deal process and trying to figure out um, how to sort of start from scratch and build the knowledge and um, the credibility to represent your product in the marketplace. Um, so I, the, mo the most important thing I would say is uh, about once you've decided you want to hire a salesperson is to um, just hire one. <laughs> don't, don't go and try to build a small team right away. Just to hire one. See if that person works out. Try, you're going to spend a lot of time helping them learn the product and learn how to sell the product. And what you want is you want them to look at what you've already sold and say, oh, my gosh, if the CEO can sell this, then I can sell much more. Right? They want, you want them to come in feeling 
ready to go and ready to, you know, build a huge business. And then if that person works, then you can hire another one. And if that person doesn't work, then you fire them and you can hire, try to fire someone else. So I think it should start slow and ramp slowly. Sort of that, um, we, we did mention this at the outset, but sort of this idea of like you're solely moving away from uh, whiteboard selling to PowerPoint selling. And it's sort of like that, that the initial rep or, rep or two maybe has to then figure out sort of the PowerPoint selling uh, model. Yeah, that's right. Uh, any any non-founder is going to have a hard time whiteboard selling. Um, there are there are people that can do it, but um, you're trying to with the difference between whiteboard selling and PowerPoint selling is that PowerPoint selling is selling a product that does exist, and whiteboard selling is selling a vision for what we're going to build. Um, so. Honestly, I'm much more of a fan of the whiteboard stage than I am. <laughs> you know how it is at Yesware. We, we, we did really well with hiring our first couple reps, and then we tried to hire too many too fast. And uh, you, it was before your time, but, um, but we really paid the cost for it. So it, it's a, it's a risk-to-business kind of thing um, to hire too many salespeople too quickly. Right. And, and I suppose, you know, there, there are investor dynamics at play to, you know, the, particularly as you start to take on venture investment that probably, you know, you've now got a different set of people inside of your company that have a different point of view about, you know, how quickly to be scaling things. So there, yes. there's, you know, there's probably other, you know, as you think about growing a company, I think you probably also got to think about how the capital structure is going to change the way or the speed at which you go to market. 100%. I'm sure I told you the story, but at one point when we were just, I think we were at about a $2 million ARR run rate, I guess, where, again, before your time. Um, and I said to one of we had just raised our B round, and I said to one of our board members, okay, you know, that was a great year. Uh, how, what, what should next year's revenue look like to be, you know, in the top tier of your portfolio? And he said, um, Triple, triple, double, double, double. So triple next year, triple the following year, double again, double again, double again, and you'll be at a hundred million dollar run rate and you know a world class company. So you know, I, what did I know? I dutifully put that into the projection spreadsheet and <laughs> <laughs> ran it out for five years, and uh, you know it just doesn't work that way. It's just not that simple. So. It, it's very difficult to match reality to expectations when you're when you have venture money. Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, some some set of companies will figure it out, but the odd state that most probably will not um, at, at that at that stage. So, well, we could do a whole another podcast, I think, on uh, on um, investor dynamics and yeah. you know scale and and all that stuff. Maybe, maybe we should do that, but yeah, we're. Cool we're running short on time for this one, um, on selling. So we'll just, I'm just going to pause here for a minute and see if, um, anybody in the audience has questions. And while, while we're seeing if anybody has questions, maybe just let people know, um, either listening live or that will eventually listen to the replay. If they want to learn more about bodes well, or they want to be in touch, what's the best way to do that? Uh, best way to be in touch. If you have questions about any of this stuff, or just want to talk about other things in general, my email is Matthew, M-A-T-T-H-E-W, at bodeswell, B-O-D-E-S-W-E-L-L, -L, dot I-O. And our website is bodeswell.io if you want to go see what we're building. Okay, great. Well, it doesn't look like uh, we're seeing any – oh, actually, maybe they're maybe – they're, Thanks, Jenny. Okay, there, here's a question uh, from Zoe, um, who you know. Um, the question is, are you having fun doing the sales yourself again in these early days or is it stressful or both? It's, yeah, it's totally both. <laughs> um, it's the good kind of startup stress, you know, but, um, and it's incredibly rewarding to show people, very successful people at large companies, what it is we built and hear their feedback. But it's also 
it feels very much like a little tiny sprout in a garden and it's springtime, but you don't know if it's going to, you know, start snowing again or not. And so it's, it has its moments of stress too. Yeah, I, I, I can imagine that's, uh, I can imagine that's, that's true. Um, you're sort of trading different types of stress for where you are in the, um, for where, where you are in, in the process. There's, you know, scaling stress, there's, yep. uh, you know, early, it's, it's hard to avoid, it's hard to avoid the, uh, it's hard to avoid the stress. I was on the, um, in this little CEO, uh, conference breakout room with, um, a guy who is uh, was a co-founder and um, CEO of a very, very famous, very, very large product-led company um, that had recently gone public. And I was sort of expecting him to say, oh, yeah, it gets easier at some point. But no, it was there he, that was not his answer. It's just like, you know, it, it, it the, it never really, it, the, like the, the types of stressors change, but the, the, the fundamental stress and pressure never, never really goes away. So it's like, uh, I guess one of these pie eating contests where the reward for winning is more pie. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It, um, the, 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 the underlying source of the stress is the ambiguity about what's this thing actually going to become. And everybody has so much riding on it. Everybody has, you know, first it's just you or your, you and your co-founder and then it's your first employees and then it's your customers and then it's your investors. And more and more people have increasing amounts riding on this thing continuing to perform. And like, no one's really sure how that's going to work out. And it's very hard to tease out the difference between being lucky and being good. So um, there's just a lot of uncertainty with all of those things. And therefore, you know, I think all of us find ourselves awake at two in the morning, staring at the ceiling, wondering, is this all going to work out? You know? And then you just get up and try to make it happen again. Right. Yeah. I mean, we could probably, it's probably, a, you know, we're lining up future episodes here. There's probably a whole nother one about like, equanimity in the startup journey. <laughs> <laughs> right. The, 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 the impossible quest. Right. Yeah, exactly right. Well, we'll, we'll have to address that in, uh, in a future episode, I suppose. But, um, hey, Matthew, really appreciate all the time um, and uh, in answering questions and, and giving people a way to be in touch. And I will certainly be talking to you soon. So uh, thanks again. Sounds great. It was a real honor being here, Joel, and nice to see you all. Okay, take care. Bye.